Now we have a trace formula. It says the trace formula is a sum over traces over infinitesimal, I mean, over the irreducible representations. And when we go from our, remember, determinant, uh, log of determinant of any matrix was a trace, uh, trace of the logarithm of the matrix. This is just identity for any matrix and certainly for finite matrices. Uh, any finite matrix and some infinite operators, trace class operators. So that was the relation between traces and spectral determinants. That's what we used to get from one to the other. And whenever we had uh, this thing summing up into the independent pieces, then determinant will get multiplied. So we finally get the determinant of 1 minus z of the original problem. We'll do the product of determinants or irreducible representations raised to the power alpha <coughs> if repre rep irreducible representation of finite group is of dimension higher than one. Now, and the problem is fancy mathematics is that you never know why should you care about it. But this piece of fancy mathematics is extremely useful. In the crudest way, you can think that you had something that was very large, and now you put it in smaller blocks. So that obviously will save in computational time. It's much more than that. So how do we find eigenvalues? The way we find eigenvalues is that we plot this function. In general, that complex pair, I'll, I'll ignore this. I'll just look at the real eigenvalues. So if you look at a function determinant of 1 minus z of our evolution operator, <coughs> then for z equals 0, that's 1. Uh, but it will be some function, and it will have some zeros. So this will give me the leading eigenvalue. This will give me the next uh, two leading eigenvalues as 2 where z is e to the minus the eigenvalue you're interested in. So i root of this polynomial, if you truncate it. But now we find that this function is a product of different functions. So what happens is that determinant of so conventionally this is the most symmetric state is called in spectroscopy, it's called A1, capital A1. You know, 100 years of experience. That's why it's called that. And what it does is it does something. And it happens to have the leading eigenvalues in that space. Then there is another term in this product. It's called determinant of 1 minus C. And there is always a fully anti-symmetric state, which is also one-dimensional. That's true always. And that one looks different because it has different eigenvalues. And maybe, most likely, its leading eigenvalue is the thing that we call S1 here, and so on. And uh, if we have the higher dimensional spaces is actually a little bit nasty because you look at the square, so, you know, it just touches zero rather than go, goes through zero, etc. So it says that, in general, this function from which you're trying to compute zeros, you know, has some structure like that. Now, both, all of these functions depend on parameters or systems, and they essentially, the spectra are not related in any simple way. So, when, when you take these functions and multiply them, you'll get something very complicated. If you have here something very complicated, it means your cycle expansion has to be longer. Because to get accurate zeros, you need more and more terms in something that's very wiggly and crazy. So what it turns out is that if you're being a fool and you're working in a full pinball, three-disc pinball, you might need cycles of length 10 or 20 to get a result which is 
accurate <coughs> as this result for cycles of length two or three. So once we knew how to factorize, we compute the escape rate for a three disk, 200 digits. But our competition, like the very good book by Pierre Gaspar that Kimberly has bought for real money, they can do it to three digits. And the reason is that uh, you know, this kind of thinking eventually really pays off. So the symmetry is, discrete symmetry pays off because you already know this from a 3D system. Instead of having ternary dynamics with pruning, you get binary dynamics with no pruning, much simpler. Instead of looking at long orbits, you get much shorter orbits because relative orbits are typically you know, a fraction of the long orbit. Because if you have orbit of length nine, then the relative orbit might be of order three repeated three times. So computation is much simpler. And then we start computing spectra. The fact that there is a factorization makes each one of the subspaces very controllable. But if you are not smart and you look at their product, which means you're looking at the whole matrix before diagonalization, it's hell. Not recommended. So now, I did it in detail for anti-symmetric case, so just one symmetry. That one was, you know, didn't show you the whole structure of the problem. So the first interesting example, which contains everything, is this three-disc system that I started the course with. It turns out it's complicated enough that if you know how to do that one, you'll know how to do any problem with finite discrete symmetry in any dimension. It doesn't have to be on a plane. It could be three-dimensional crystal or 